George emailed me, and the header said, speaker opportunity. <laughs> so I have to thank George for this opportunity for two reasons. Um, firstly, I, I put this PowerPoint presentation together 10 years ago for a Master Gardener symposium, a year after I graduated from the Master Gardener course. And um, since then, I have gotten a beautiful camera. So I have added lots of pictures from my own garden to the presentation. And um, second, I have learned how to add notes to PowerPoint presentations and have them not show up for you, which is just totally amazing. I opened this and went, oh my goodness, there's no information here. So I had to do a lot of research in the last month. So please remind me never to take one of these gigs in the summer again, because my garden is a mess. <laughs> so as George was saying, I've been spending a lot of time with the insects in my backyard, and I have come to the conclusion that there really is no such thing as a bad bug. All living things have their place in the world, and um, attracting beneficial insects to the garden is a hot topic these days. But when you think about it, if you're doing everything you need to do to attract beneficial insects, you're going to attract all of the insects that those beneficial insects come to your garden to eat. Mm -hmm. So there's really not any way you can get one without the other. Um, so, I'm going to point out three things you need to do to attract insects to your garden. And the first one is plant lots of flowers. This is my solution to all of the problems of the world. <laughs> most insects come to your garden on wings, and most flying insects are pollinators. So it's important to have early blooms and late blooms. Um, pollen is rich in protein, and some insects' lives, entire life cycles, last from 10 to 14 days. So when they come out of the ground first thing in the spring, they're very hungry, and they immediately need lots of protein in order to be able to <coughs> mate and reproduce. This is zinnia and coreopsis in my yard, and insects love great flowers from the composite family um, because the centers are made up of lots of little teeny flowers, and they're perfect for little teeny insects to feed on. Insects love herbs. This is anise hyssop in a pot in my garden. And you should plant thyme, dill, oregano, cilantro, all of the mints, uh, mints, salvia. And some herbs are actually host plants for butterflies. So if you're wanting to attract butterflies, research the host plants. Humble flowers like yarrow and Queen Anne's lace are real fast food restaurants for pollinators. They just have so many little flowers on one flower bed. And you should definitely plant some natives to provide hangouts for the locals. This is the pollinators garden at the Springfield Museums. And in this garden, there's New York ironweed, the atris, three cultivars of vivam, Asclepius tuberosa and incarnata, and four species of rubecchia. And it just hums all season long while it's in bloom. The next thing you want to provide for insects is water, especially in the early spring, before um, there are lots of flowers in the garden in bloom providing nectar. This is platycondon balloon flower <coughs> with dew drops on it. If it gets really dry out, you should use an overhead sprinkler sometimes so that the water catches on the petals of, of the plants. And then you can put out nice little shallow dishes for the insects. You don't want them too deep. You don't want them to drown. Um, I put teacup saucers around my garden, and every now and then I notice that they disappear because my husband picks them up and puts them in the dishwasher. <laughs> you have to prevent, um, provide shelter for your plants, so it's important to plant trees and shrubs for shelter and shade. 
My garden is only 40 feet by 60 feet, but there are shrubs on all four sides. Um, if you have a particular plant that you know this has got a lot of pollinators on it, I want you to go out at dusk and you will see that most of them have gone home. They're no longer there. So where did they go? You have to remember that insects overwinter in leaf litter at the base of host plants. If you clean up all the debris in the fall, they'll have no place to hibernate. Now, I know this is exactly the opposite of what a lot of people tell you when um, you're vegetable gardening. They say, oh no, clean absolutely everything up, and then the insects won't be able to overwinter in the soil. Well, unfortunately, spiders and many beneficial insects overwinter as eggs, adults, and pupae in leaf litter at the base of the plant where they're expecting their prey to show up. So um, debris is a necessary part of a healthy winter garden. So this is aphids on um, Asclepius incarnata. And while many beneficial insects are pollinators as adults, they can be predators during their larval stage. And they won't come to your garden or survive to adulthood if there is nothing there to eat. So your goal should never be to eliminate every single pest in your yard. Um, that's not being a good host. So I, I'm going to talk about five categories of insects. We just saw pests. We have pollinators. We have predators. This is a lady beetle, beetle larva. And we have parasites. This is a parasitic wasp, aphidius. And then we have those insects that we just love to see in our garden. So why do we want them in our gardens? Well, we need insects to pollinate our plants. I wouldn't have goldfinches <coughs> pulling the petals off my zinnias if I didn't have pollinators to make seeds. Mm -hmm. um, they break down organic material. We would be up to our ears in rotting leaves if we didn't have um, insects breaking down the leaves and they aerate the soil. So we'd be standing on hard pack if we didn't have those grubs, worms, and ants in our soil. So having lots of insects create a natural balance in the garden and not interfering with the natural balance by using pesticides makes the garden a more enjoyable and healthy place for everyone concerned. So how do we know who's who? You need to spend time in your garden looking at the insects, ha looking at what's happening and who's visiting. And um, if you're a note taker, you can take um, detailed notes, time, weather, and plant da damage. That's gonna help you when you do your research. And you should take pictures. All of my pictures on my iPad are according to date. So I know if I took a picture of a pest on May 20th this year, that pest is going to show up around that date again next year, and it gives me the opportunity to be ready for it and do things so that the damage isn't so bad. You want to identify the insects in your garden, and this is not as hard as it sounds. All you really have to do is type in a few descriptive words into your search engine, and then click images. And then look through all the images, find the bug you're looking for, click on that, and it should tell you what the bug is. Then you just start all over again, and you type the name of the bug in, and you can verify that that is the bug you've got. And then you can start doing your research. So you want to research their um, habitat and their life cycles to determine which are pests and which are beneficials. And sometimes an insect could be both. At one stage of its life, it could be ben beneficial. At another stage, it could be a pest. I have got two beautiful honeysuckle in my yard. And if I am not careful, this is what it ends up looking like. So I have an aphid problem. This is aphids. And this picture was taken on May 29th of this year. So 
Most aphids are monophagous, which means that every species has its own host plant. Um, their reproduction cycle is very complicated. They overwinter in the soil into eggs, and in the spring, female insects hatch. Some have wings, and other are, others are wingless. These females find their way to the tender shoots of the host plant. They then insert their piercing mouth parts into the phloem and start sucking the life out of the plant. <laughs> While attached to the plant, the aphids begin to reproduce asexually in telescoping generations. So they give birth to live female aphids who attach themselves to the plant and begin sucking and they in turn have babies who do that and that's how you get this look oh. on the plant <laughs> and you can see there are some large ones there are some with wings and there are lots of little babies and they start at the tip and they just start working their way down the stem so my solution is to find where they stop and cut that off and dump it into a bucket of soapy water. Now you may think, okay, this lady has no flowers left on her plant, but that's not true. I had beautiful bloom on both of my plants this year. This is a uh, Lonosa Sempire Virens, Major Wheeler, which is our native coral honeysuckle. And this is Mandarin honeysuckle. And these were both, pictures were both taken on June 4th, about a week after I took that first one. So I, I did a good job, and I ended up with good, good blooms, and I didn't use any pesticides. Unfortunately, there were years when I wasn't so lucky. Um, this was a few years ago, and while I lost a lot of flowers, I did get to see the full life cycle of the Laban beetle in my yard. You can see the adult on the left and her eggs on the right. Here are the babies after they hatched the larvae. And first they eat their eggs, they clean up the site first. And, and then they disperse all over the plant and they feed as individuals. There's one. And then they decay. And this is um, on, this is on, Asclepius incarn incarnata, the um, swamp milkweed, the same year. And here's an adult that came out of one of those pupae down there, sunning herself, and she's going to harden up her shell. And then she's going to walk down that plant, and she's going to eat those aphids <laughs> that are on that plant. And there's a cute little wasp in the middle of that leaf. Can you see it right yeah, at the bend? Yeah. So cute. So he's probably going to have lunch with her. <laughs> uh, I noticed this year that there were aphids on this flower, but they were all dead. So I asked myself, who did that for me? And I went looking, and I found these two little guys. Um, this is syrphid fly larvae. Um, they are born legless and blind, and their mouths have triple-pointed darts on them for them to spear their prey before they suck it dry. So hoverflies, or syrphid flies, um, mimic bees and wasps in their markings and coloration. They also have the ability to hover above flowers and hum like bees, too, so that people think, oh, maybe this this bug has a stinger, I'm gonna stay away from it. They do not have stingers. Um, there are three characteristics that help us tell them apart. In the diptera, the fly on the left, you can see it has goggle eyes, great big eyes, and they have single wings, even though the venation makes it look like they have double wings. They only have one wing on each side. And their antennae are shaped like these, and they come out of the center of their head together. Now the, the um, hymenoptera, 
is a real bee on the right. And um, they have almond-shaped eyes. And they have two wings on each side, double wings. And their antennae come out separated just a little bit. And they look like little rows of beads if you look really closely. And they, they use them to feel around. They move. The fly antennae don't really do anything. I get signals, I guess. There are 200 genera and 6,000 species of serpent flies. So you can see some of them look like wasps, some of them look like bees. Some of them are very, very tiny, and they're gold with green wings. Very, very interesting. The eggs are laid singly um, right by the prey. So they're blind, but mom puts them right where they can feel around and, and find supper. And when the um, larva is ready to pupate, it drops to the ground, creates the cocoon, and overwinters in the soil and debris at the base of the plant. Um, before I leave honeysuckle, I wanted to point out the clear wing hummingbird moth. Its host plant is the coral honeysuckle. Mm -hmm. So if you're seeing holes in your honeysuckle, look for this little green guy with the spots and the horn at the back. Um, this is aphidius. He's a very handsome, tiny parasitic wasp, or she is. It's only a tenth of an inch long. She deposits her eggs with her ovipositor into aphids. When the eggs hatch, the larvae eat the aphid from the inside, um, and then they pupate right in the aphid, and the adults emerge, leaving a mummified aphid behind. So here's an adult emerging, and, and those are the, you can see the legs left on them. Their entire life cycle is only between 10, 10 and 14 days. And I found mummified aphids on this globe amaranth. I only have five rose bushes in my yard, <coughs> and they're all, they're all different. And I never see enough damage on them to ever do anything about it. But as I was um, talking to you, I decided did, we didn't, we missed IPM, and I don't know how we did that. I'm going back. I must have jumped. Um, as master gardeners, we are encouraged to encourage everyone to use this method when determining what they're going to do about pests in their backyards. And the first thing you do, obviously, is identify the pests. And I've gone over that. And then you ask yourself, oh, can I tolerate that damage? And obviously, with the aphids on my honeysuckle. I was not able to, but I was able to solve the problem without using any pesticides. So the first thing you want to do is ask yourself, is the plant healthy? Because healthy plants sustain insect damage a lot better than unhealthy plants. You know, if my honeysuckle weren't healthy, the aphids would say, let's just finish this off, put it out of its misery. <laughs> Um, so once you determine that your plant is healthy, you've done everything you can to make your plant healthy, you want to use either mechanical or physical controls to deal with the pest. And obviously, picking the bugs off is um, a mechanical way of dealing with the problem. If you have um, cucumbers that are being bothered, you might want to put a row cover over it. Or you might want to put some kind of a trap in the garden to trap the insects. Um, if that if simple mechanical and physical controls don't work, you can look to biological controls. You can see if there's uh, a beneficial insect that can take care of your problem for you. Um, there is a bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis Bt, which can um, it naturally occurs in the soil, but you can add extra. And it um, deals with grubs by uh, interrupting their digestive systems, and they die. The only problem is, is that you're killing all the grubs. And not just the one you're looking for. I mean, you know, if you say, oh, I have Japanese beetles, I'm going to kill off all the Japanese beetles. Well, this is going to 
kill off other bugs too. So, um, or you could use <coughs> chemical controls. And according to integrated pest management, you want to choose the least toxic chemical control you possibly can. Um, starting probably with um, horticulture soap solutions or oil solutions. Um, if you use these, you have to be very careful that your plant is healthy and that your plant um, has got all the water it needs before you use it because it, it's intended to smother the insect and you have to completely cover the plant and all the insects in order for it to work. And that, of course, you know, covers the leaf too, and tends to dry it out. It, you know, it can't absorb moisture from the air, and it, it can't breathe until it wears off. Once they're dry, they wear off very quickly. And if you haven't solved your problem, then you have to do it again or or use something else. And I, master gardeners do not recommend using broad spectrum chemicals at all. Um, who knows what they're going to do to the environment. And we know that they kill more insects than the insects you're trying to target. So while I was at it, I decided that I would use the IPM method to find out who is doing the damage to my rose, which is why we went back. Um, so I looked and looked and looked for an insect and couldn't find one. So I just typed in to my search engine, who is eating my rose bush and what is eating my rose bush? Leaves came up. So I clicked on that. And the first culprit I thought it might be was the leaf cutter bee. And leaf cutter bees use foliage, the foliage they cut out, to make nest cells for their young. And they cut a, a piece of the leaf and then form what they call a nursery chamber. And the female lays one egg in it and then stuffs it with pollen and good stuff for uh, the baby to eat when it hatches. Um, and each nest cell looks like um, a bit of an end of a cigar. But these bees are very important horticulture pollinators. So. Every site recommended that you just let them eat your roses. Keep them happy. Here are the nursery cells. Aren't they cool? They stack them one on top of each other and stuff them into a long hole. And these bees are such important pollinators that it's recommended you buy them these condo buildings from very expensive catalogs. Um, they're going to still cut the leaves off your roses, though, because that's what they do. So this isn't the damage I was looking at originally. So I knew it was not the rose cutter bee. So I went back and I looked at my plant and discovered this little guy. And this is where I typed in little green worm eating my rose bush. And it came, you know, I, I planted press images, found him, and he is a um, rose slug, the offspring of a um, sawfly. And it's about half an inch long, and it's the same green as the underside of the leaf, and has an orange or tan head. And this is the adult. So the adult. Um, is not a fly. It is in the order Hymenoptera, so it's really a wasp. Go figure. But in the spring, the female uses her saw-like and serrated ovipositor to cut into the edges of the leaf and lay eggs. And um, when the egg hatches, it, um, in the early stages, it creates this window pane effect. It just eats through one side of the leaf and creates a window pane effect. But then as it gets bigger, it starts eating um, holes in, into the leaf. Um, there's only one generation. So when 
the um, larva is big enough and it's getting ready to pupate, it just drops to the ground, hides in the litter, it makes a little cocoon and stays there for over the winter. So that's why you only see the kind of damage I was seeing in May and June. Um, and uh, you can hand pick them or you can wash them off with a, a heavy spray. Um, you can cut off the leaf and drop the leaf, whole leaf in the bucket. Um, or you can leave them for predators. And I saw big paper wasps hanging around this rose bush and I said, We'll just, we'll just leave this for somebody else to take care of. Um, I did squish the little green guy, though. So here is the damage, and you can see the window pane effect, where they just chomped through one layer of the leaf. There are 8,000 species of sawflies in the United States. And some species, only three of them eat roses, but some species can do extensive damage to their host plants. Um, and I don't know if these two insects are related. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I can't remember. I didn't have any notes. Um, so if, if you come across them like this, you can knock them off really easily. So you could put a sheet underneath the plant and just shake and shake and shake and then gather them all up and either drown them or burn them, whatever you want. This is the tussock moth, and I've never had a problem with it, but I've identified it for several people. Um, and and inf an infestation can really exfoliate a plant very quickly, in like 48 hours. Um, so hand picking is recommended as a good way to deal with them, but their bristles cause a rash. So if you're going to hand pick them, you want to wear gloves and you want to wear long sleeves for the job. This is the Asiatic garden beetle. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of you may not have seen it because it is a nocturnal feeder. It's a scarab beetle and it's closely related to the Japanese beetle. Mm -hmm. But it feeds on over 100 ornamental plants, including dahlias and um, asters and zinnias and roses, and it even eats chrysanthemums. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize anything ate chrysanthemums, but I have some that come up every year in my garden. <coughs> and I was noticing that they were just totally getting decimated, you know, long before a flower bud was going to come on them. So because they are nocturnal feeders, the only way to confirm that this is the devil eating your plant is to go out at night with a flashlight and actually check. Um, and once again, they're easy to knock off the plants. So if you just have a dish of wash, water, soapy water, and you just pull your plant down and go bang, 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 they do fall off really easily. Um, I actually used neem one year. But if you're going to use neem oil, does everybody know what neem oil is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Neem oil, um, you can buy in concentrate, and it's from a neem tree. And it um, creates a bad taste for insects. They do not like it. Um, it is not supposedly hazardous for people or pollinators because pollinators move around, but it disrupts the neurological system of an insect that eats it. So they forget to eat and they forget to mate. But I have never used it when there are flowers on the plant because I don't believe that it's not going to affect pollinators. Mm -hmm. So um, when my chrysanthemums were almost gone, I said, okay, I gotta save them, and I did spray them with neem oil. So this has gotta be the bottom of a trap. Um, they're attracted to artificial light. And I have got window boxes between my door light and my garden. And this is what I imagine the bottom of those uh, window boxes look like. And the blue jays come every fall, every spring, 
and totally rip my window boxes <coughs> apart and eat all of these guys. So you can make a trap to attract them and catch them. However, if you're going to do this, make sure you do it far away from your garden because you're going to attract every Asiatic garden beetle in the world to come and visit this trap. Did you use one in New York? No. So this is the lily leaf beetle. It's from Europe. It's an import. It was discovered in Canada in 1945. Um, apparently, it's a really good flyer. But it, it also has been transported on nursery stock. Mm -hmm. And it is now here. And it really does decimate lilies, Asiatic lilies. Mm -hmm. So good cultural practices are very important for the survival of your lilies because this beetle likes moist, cool locations. And when I moved into my house, there were lilies planted on one side of the house in the shade, up against the foundation, oh, and they just oh, didn't works. have a chance. Right. So I no longer grow Asiatic lilies. Um, each adult female can lay up to 450 eggs. Uh, the complete life cycle takes around 60 days, so there is enough time for there to be two generations in one growing season. In Europe, they have natural predators, native predators, that take care of these. Um, unfortunately, because it's not native, we don't have native predators. Mm -hmm. But they are working on finding a parasite to take care of them. And I know UMass is working on it. Mm -hmm. And a couple of releases have taken place in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, so there is still hope. Um, there there's no way of getting rid of them without using really nasty chemicals. So um, it's recommended that hand picking, which is really disgusting, because um, the larva protects itself by scooping its poop up onto its back. So they really are disgusting. Um, this is an earwig. And earwigs are another nocturnal feeder. And they like to hide in cool, moist places and can often be found around compost areas. Um, they really don't do very much damage. Um, but if you want to get rid of them, if you have them, and you want to get rid of them, you can create a trap by rolling up damp newspaper, putting rubber bands on it. And at night, they will crawl into the newspaper. And you can either loosen it a little and bang them into a bucket with some water and bleach, or you can burn the whole newspaper. Um, I did see one trap at a professional garden where they had PVC pipe about that thick, and they stuffed it with straws, and they painted it green. And they did crawl into it, and the gardener came along in the morning and picked them up and went bang, bang, bang into the bucket of <laughs> soapy water. So they make little nests in the ground. They overwinter as adults and make little nests an inch or two down in the soil. And um, they actually take care of their babies until they grow up. They, um, you know, don't pupate. They just uh, shed their skin over and over again. Have several in stars before they become adults. This is cyclamen mite damage on my mom's hood. Mm. And this took me forever to identify. I finally found it in a 1938 Mass Aggie butt hook. It, the mite is invisible to the naked eye. And they feed on uh, the flower blossoms, and they just destroy them and distort, distort them. Um, I found that pinching the flower buds, when, as soon as I see any damage, really reduces the amounts of mites I have. But it also reduces the amount of flowers I have, because they're late bloomers to begin with. So if you pinch off all the buds, they don't have time to create new buds. Um, 
There are species of predatory mites that you can purchase online for 20 plus dollars. Mm -hmm. But um, I discovered a predatory mite in my backyard that um, has been really happy to help me with this problem. And this is Anistis. It's a predatory mite. It's called a running mite. They're red and tiny. And you can identify them because they run all over the place. You see them on there. They're running up and down. They're looking for something to eat. There's lots of them in my compost pile. And they're obviously helping to break things down there for me. Um, so whenever I come across one on a leaf or on a pot or something that I can pick up, I pick it up and I run across the yard and I deposit it on the monk's hood. And they go right to work in the buds. You can see, you know, they can see what I can't see. I'm going to introduce you to a few beneficial insects that you might not be familiar with. So just, you know, as you're looking at insects, even if they're creepy looking, they might be good guys. And you should really know what you're killing before you kill anything. This is a minute pirate bug. Um, it's a true bug, what is called a true bug. And in the hemiptera order. And true bugs um, do not go through complete metamorphosis. They lay eggs, and when the babies hatch, they look like the adults, but they don't have wings. Adults have wings. And they go through several instars until they grow to adulthood, and then they develop wings. And at all stages, the minute pirate bug is a predator of aphids and soft-bodied insects. So it's a, a good one to have around. This is a Phidiolites. It's a small fly. And it feeds on aphid honeydew as an adult. And it can lay 100 to 250 shiny orange eggs among a colony of aphids. Um, and then the small bright orange slugs come out of the eggs, and they inject a toxin into the aphids' legs to paralyze them. So they can then um, slit their throats, basically, and suck the life out of them. So they can consume aphids much larger than them. And uh, they can they get to be only an eighth of an inch long, and they can kill four to 65 aphids in a day. So if you're going to use a horticultural soap on your aphids, chances are you be, could be getting some of these good guys who are, are there trying to solve your problem for you. This is, um, these are tachymid flies. You can tell tachymid flies because they all have yes. hairy butts. Um. <laughs> um, they have very complex mouth parts. Some of them can really bite and, and grab um, a, a caterpillar and kill it. Um, and others are parasitic and they lay their eggs under the wings of beetles and the, the larvae eat the host. Um, the United States imported a specific one to take care of the gypsy moth caterpillar. Unfortunately, it has also taken the Luna moth mm -hmm. to the point of extinction. And we still have gypsy moths. And we still have gypsy moths. <laughs> so they're, they're like um, the seraphid flies in that they're very different looking. There are lots and lots of species. <laughs> and they all look different. This is the green lacewing. And this is a, the adult is also um, nocturnal, but the larva feeds on soft-bodied insects like aphids. And they lay their eggs on these little stems. It's very interesting. And then they build cocoons on the back of the plants. I'm sure a lot of you have seen the brachnid wasp. There are 1,700 species of the brachnid wasp in, North, wasp in North America. This is the tomato hornworm moth, wasp, excuse me. And um, it, it lays its eggs under the skin of the caterpillar, and the larvae eat the insides of the caterpillar. 
and then come to the surface and make cocoons. So you can see on the caterpillar, those aren't eggs, those are cocoons. And then they emerge as adults. And this is Dickypus. He's a true bug. And it's used in greenhouses to control flies, um, white flies. They eat white flies. <laughs> this is a damsel bug. And um, <coughs> the adult lays eggs near prey. And um, it also eats soft bodied insects like um, aphids. A lot of these are greenhouse insects that they breed to work in greenhouses. Now we've gotten to the point of fabulous insects. I did not take this picture, but it is so gorgeous. I just had to show it to you. I have had praying mantis in my garden. So the one in the right is from my garden. And believe it or not, that's supposed to be um, a pot with a tomato plant in it. And I have no idea what else is in that pot. But that praying mantis hung out there for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And the one on the left is looking for a safe, dry place to leave its egg case over the winter. And the egg case is called Utica. It kind of feels like one of those um, peanuts, styrofoam peanuts mm -hmm. that you oh, wow. use as packing oh. material. That's really what they feel like. The praying mantis on the left was a pet in my yard for over a month. It lived on that plant, and it would come out every morning, and it would skewer and eat flies. And then in the evening, it would walk down to the base of the plant and hang out underneath everything all night long to protect itself. And it went on for a month. It was really fabulous. And on the right, that's a baby praying mantis. They look a lot like ants. Mm -hmm. And here is part of my dragonfly collection. Dragonflies are predators, but they will eat absolutely everything, including each other. So, you know, getting them to come to your garden as a beneficial insect is really mostly beneficial for what they look like because, you know, they could grab a bumblebee and have it for a snack. Now, I have this common garden spider all around my house, and I think spiders are creepy, but this one weaves this beautiful web, and there are lots of biting insects in late summer for some reason in my soil, and these spiders catch a lot of those and also catch a lot of late summer mosquitoes <coughs> for them. This is the great golden digger wasp. It's an absolutely beautiful wasp. It's about um, an inch and a half long. The only problem with it is that it captures caterpillars and it is indiscriminate. And it lays an egg in them and then buries them in the ground. And this beautiful creature is a Midas fly. It's named for the gold band around its abdomen. And they live as a larvae in the ground for up to a year and they eat Japanese beetles and other larvae in your lawn. Mm. So if you're using a broad spectrum <coughs> grub killer, you're killing these guys too. <laughs> so the adult only leave, lives for a couple of weeks after living as um, you know, a grub for over a year. And fireflies are having a problem because of light pollution. Yeah. Uh, they only mate when it's dark. Yes. And in Springfield, nothing is dark because everybody has extra lights on their house outside at night. And I love it when the um, butterflies visit my garden. For some reason, the tiger swallowtails always have a chunk out of one wing. So somebody likes them. I think this is the black swallowtail. And this is an advertisement for planting late blooming flowers. This is a New England aster, and this was um, at my home in Ashburnham, so it was probably the beginning of October when this picture was taken, and that's when the monarch showed up up north. Um, and I have skippers in my garden. Skipper um, larvae curl the leaves of their host plants over. 
So if that's creeping you out, it may just be a cute little skipper, butterfly. And this beautiful Katie did just dropped out of nowhere and landed on a red coleus for me to take a picture of it. Wasn't that nice? And I could show you bumblebees all day long. Um, here is a poor bumblebee with two males trying to mate with her. And this darling little bug is a two-spotted stink bug. It is only one of two species of beneficial stink bugs in the area. It is a pollinator rather than a plant eater, and it, it came to visit me. So, thank you very much for coming this evening. I want everybody to enjoy your gardens. Um, your garden should be natural environments, so just let nature take its course. And uh, perfection shouldn't be the goal. Getting rid of all the pests in your garden should not be the goal. And if you can, delay autumn cleanup until spring and give some of those beneficial insects um, some place to hide during the winter and try not to use pesticides. A well-balanced natural garden is the healthiest kind of garden you can have for everybody. So thank you very much. Thank you.